السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سيدات والسادة الكرام أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم اليوم العلمي الأول لكلية إدارة الأعمال 2020 بالجامعة الليبية الدولية للعلوم الطبية الذي نستعرض فيه مجموعة من الأبحاث العلمية والعروض التقديمية الخاصة بالطلبة أتينا كفجر نزيح الظلام فكنا الضياء بشمس فتيح أولى فقراتنا في هذا اليوم كلمة عميد كلية إدارة الأعمال الدكتور صبري جبران بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف مرسلين سيدنا نبينا محمد النبي الكريم وعلى أصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وأسعد الله أوقاتكم بكل خير الأخوة والأخوات الأعزاء مرحبا بكم في اليوم العلمي لكلية إدارة الأعمال بالجامعة الليبية الدولية طبعا اليوم العلمي هو حدث أكاديمي تفتخر فيه أي مؤسسة تعليمية كانت بإنجازات أساتذتها وطلابها والمشرفين التعليميين في هذا اليوم العلمي تفتخر كلية إدارة الأعمال بعرض الأبحاث الطلاب وإنجازاتهم خلال العام الدراسي 2020-2021 وهذه الانجازات الطلابيه تعكس جوده الاداء ومستوى الانجاز خلال الفتره الماضيه. ختاما نتمنى ان تكون هذه الابحاث والانجازات العلميه مفيده للجميع وتطلع المزيد من العمل والانجاز على صعيد البحث العلمي والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. شكرا دكتور صبري الآن سنستعرض على حضراتكم الأنشطة العلمية الخاصة بالطلبة تحت إشراف نخبة من أعضاء هيئة التدريس بالكلية So hello everyone, my name is Shahd Adharab and today I'm going to explain to you the impact of COVID-19 on marketing Okay, so as an introduction, we all know that marketing is one of the most important tool in business. And without marketing, we won't be able to know the benefits of the product. We won't be able to know um, how this product works. And we won't be able to know the product because advertising, um, marketing is done easily by advertising. And throughout advertising, we know the benefits of the certain product. So here we have the famous marketer, Philip Kotler, and he said, marketing is not the art of finding clever ways to dispose of what you make. It is the art of creating genuine customer value. So we all know that, that um, Philip Kotler um, deals with customers as like a whole priority. He always gives them like the right to give um, the freedom to give their rights to like, um, yeah, and he always like listens to consumers. We have here the literature review, literature review that studies um, the digital age. So here we have like the digital age, age has been improving since 2009 until now. They have been like developing their channels. They have been developing uh, different strategies of digital marketing. And back then we used to use digital marketing, but only like uh, to advertise certain products. Advertising was done at a certain amount to a certain age because not all of us we, we used to like use a lot of social media but now in this like special uh, catastrophe all ages throughout the world we started using con uh, we started using and consuming a lot of internet connections so here we have our themes, we're going to talk about marketing, COVID-19, COVID-19 and the shift in consumer behavior, advertising, price and new product launch, corporate sales and the special issue, digital around the world in 2020. Okay, so here we're talking about marketing and COVID-19. So um, when we're talking about marketing and COVID-19, this era, like um, a lot of things happened. Um, habits have been developing um, like we started like getting good 
of our like old habits because we started like um, staying at home a lot and we're like losing more, um, losing less time outside and in the streets. And as we said that COVID-19, when it first appeared in March, 2020, um, it's like it gave an alert to all consumers, all companies everywhere that dilemmas, catastrophes are like, um, are normal things that happens all around the world at a, like a specific time or at a sudden time. Okay, so here we have the most, uh, most famous like firm, Google. That said, a lot of um, cons like a lot of consumers started purchasing online, and a lot of consumers started using this firm a lot. So Google has been like benefiting a lot since this dilemma happened because whenever we see like an online um, app, or for example, we want to purchase something online, we go through Google and we search through that point. Okay, so here we have. Uh, most been, uh, most businesses they have the plan B strategy in their like company, so they benefited a lot because as soon as this catastrophe happened, they started shifting to their plan B. But some companies didn't have this time to shift and uh, to this plan B because they didn't have the plan B ready. The plan B is like, for example, when any catastrophe happens, they shift to this time. Okay, so uh, mostly in this catastrophe. Um, online businesses, like for example, Zoom benefited a lot throughout this. Um, online entertainment, like for example, we have the famous game PUBG. Everyone started spending more time in it. Um, and like online restaurants, like deliveries and stuff like that. Okay, so that that's when it comes to um, marketing in COVID-19 and how businesses shifted to their plan B. Now we come with the COVID-19 and the shift in consumer behavior. Okay, so we have two main categories in um, this like shift in consumer behavior. We have, first of all, shift, um, you have, first of all, consumer packaged goods and non-durable consumer goods. So in consumer packaged goods, um, we have like the food, the uh, cleaning, like the home cleaning things and we have the um cosmetics so we started purchasing those on uh, online and like we are we are free to purchase any of those products and like we know that for example what we see is gonna come but the non-durable uh products like the vegetables like the clothes so like we don't know actually if the vegetables are gonna arrive fresh are gonna arrive like the size of them so you don't you cannot like uh, really recognize the size and uh, the clothes also the clothes you cannot like uh, recognize what sides you like um are gonna get exactly so um those two main things uh the first one benefited a lot as i said in the consumer packaged goods and now what you see throughout social media is gonna come like it's gonna be come to you the exact uh, same thing okay and here we have advertising process price and new product launch so advertising as i said is an important tool that was seen by a lot of um companies they started playing upon this um point and they started developing it and they started choosing colors and they started making surveys for online surveys that like take less than one minute uh, to know um, what consumers need uh, and their product. And they started using the advertising as what the consumer needs. And we have the price. So a lot of price reduction has become like uh, a huge point in our life. They started reducing price. And uh, in the new product launch, they started producing new products. Every firm started staying on this point a lot because they don't want consumer. Because since we're staying at home a lot, so we're gonna fake focus about like small little details, like sometimes fake um, products. You don't like recognize another fake unless they come to you. So they started think upon this. Uh, even if the product was like copy original or fake, they started like improving the quality of the product, and they started like. Um, producing a similar product. 
Okay, uh, that's all because they didn't want consumer to shift on um, other companies. So, and the corporate sales, there has been like a big, a big changes, and a survey has been done across eleven countries in seven sectors and across fourteen categories uh, to like um, to try and understand the consumers' habits. So first of all, they did the spend. They started like uh, digging deeper through uh, what consumers actually spend on and how much do they spend, um, like in time and in money. They started seeing the digital. Okay, so business to business companies um, said in a, um, online businesses is really important because it helped a lot like online businesses benefited a lot they used to benefit um throughout the past era because it's time consuming for like people who have work and don't have time to go to like businesses and search for the products and to rely on a certain product okay and then the last point is that remote so 90 percent of companies and 90 percent of sales as well has moved through video conferencing so as i said and meetings have been done throughout zoom uh throughout other like uh google meet they started video conferencing and launching their new products like the um like the um like what we saw in Apple, what they launched their new phones and their new smartwatch throughout video conferencing the world okay so this special issue um so this special is issue illustrates that um a lot of like consumer habits is are gonna change a lot after this pandemic because we learned a lot of new things um old consumers old employees because they stayed at home a lot so they started improving their old habits they started improving their talents they started like taking online courses since a lot a lot of people uh, benefited throughout those online courses okay so in my own perspective i said and uh, um, a lot of people are going to become more creative since they spend more time at home and since they like see online videos and crafts. OK, but like a small amount of people who didn't benefit from this are going to struggle a lot because, as I said, pandemics, catastrophes are free to happen all around the world. OK, so here I have a diagram of digital around the world. I said and um, uh, the population of people uh, that they used to use internet and people that use only mobile phones worldwide and people who like use social media only to um, send uh, emails for businesses schools and universities okay so in my conclusion i said um that um that covid 19 has changed our life a lot changed businesses and impacted on marketing a lot Okay, and made a lot of employees aware and a lot of managers aware um, of any catastrophe that is going to happen at any time. And um, and yeah, so I'd like to thank Mr. Siraj a lot for helping me in this um, research that I uh, that took me um, a lot of time actually to work on and six articles to read. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Suzanne Yahoui. I'm a third year business student majoring in marketing in the Faculty of Business Administration in the Libyan International Medical University. I'm here today to discuss my poster about the COVID-19 market recession. So as we all know that the world has changed dramatically in the last couple of months, where a rare disaster, a coronavirus pandemic, has hit, causing a lot of lives to be lost. So as countries implement the necessary quarantines and social distance practices to contain, to contain the pandemic, the world has been put in great lockdown. So for the first time since the Great Depression, both advanced economies and emerging markets and developing economies are in recession. 
So this poster is to examine the extent of the influence of the lockdown and whether or not the market's reaction would be similar to the pre and post lockdown period caused by COVID-19. So the issue of predicting the prevalence of any recession might partly make a crease for the overall absence of studies within the domain. It's but an element warrant additional attention by marketers. Not solely thanks to the difficulty that individual cooperations may expertise throughout such periods, however, conjointly because of the small social prices and private miseries that will generate. So usually when conducting any type of research, we go back to previous researches to obtain the data and compare it between them. In this case, since this is a very rare disaster, there isn't any data to go back to. So we have two complete different methods of sampling techniques. We have probability and we have non-probability samplings. In probability samplings, the sampling or, or stratified sampling, because it can also be called the possibility of every case to be elite, the population is known and frequently equal for all cases. While on the other hand, non-probabilities, sampling or fault finding sampling is that the opposite the prospect of a member from the population to be alive is not identified here, which makes the non-probability sampling the preferable technique for us to use in this case. Why? Because we don't have any data to go back to to compare between them. As you can see over here, we have an example of a type of organization that conducted an examination to see the extent of its consumptions of, it, of its product by its consumers. Whether it was similar in the pre or how it has increased or decreased really post lockdown. Over here, we can see that in the first month, the intake of their product has increased by 10%. While on the third month, the intake of their consumption has declined by 15%. On the other hand, in the fifth month, it has increased back up to 20%. Why? Due to the consumer staying at home, due to the social distancing and quarantine. So as a conclusion, the COVID-19 has affected the majority of exchanges around the world because of the virus occurrence. It pushed the world into the crisis of the century. The whole imprisonment and social distancing are that the sole resolution for preventing the spreading of the virus. WHO declared the lockdown as a protecting measure. The lockdown contains a positive impact of the stock market performance until things improve within the world. So as a recommendation, the investors can take precautionary steps before actually trading in the stocks during this time of lockdown. The risk investors can avoid trading around of the lockdown to avoid the risk linked to changeable stocks in the lockdown period. The result of this benefit investors as it may help them better understand and evaluate the impact of the lockdown on the stock markets caused by COVID-19. Also, the help of digital marketing and online marketing can conduct better results. Thank you for listening and stay safe. Hello, my name is Salim Al Nahdwi. I am a third year business administration student at Limo. My topic for the first annual scientific day will be the relationship between brand and culture. Uh, as an abstract, in, uh, in this research paper, the attempt was done to prove the relationship between brand and culture and other related variables. Uh, this poster was conducted after reviewing five re previous research papers that had mutual title. As an introduction, uh, brands are in stores, in posters, TV advertisements, and on the internet. They are wherever we look. We basically consume the brands every day. We wear them, 
whenever we browse the internet, we find them right in front of us. Cultures, on the other hand, are the ideas, customs, and social behavior of individuals or a particular country or society. <clears throat> However, both are closely linked in the sense that culture has an impact on brands and their success in foreign markets. Consumers consider that they own the brand as an outcome. Consumers search for self-identification with brands. <clears throat> Failure is contagious and brands in general observe the acts of one another and make efforts to replicate them. Uh, the methodology that was used in the research papers were questionnaires that are reviewing interviews and exploratory research to accomplish the intended study. Basically, uh, the methodology that I used personally was re reviewing previous research researches that had a similar title. Uh, the results of the research papers were preferences of international brands either in the Iranian or Indian market, Thus, brands should consider multicultural conceptions through culturally sensitive marketing communication strategies. And international brands such as Cadbury Dairy Milk and Coca-Cola have maintained their position as dominant players in the Indian market. Even with the existence of rival companies, they did not lose their popularity. Uh, as for Coca-Cola and Cadbury Dairy Milk, in these five research papers, most of the dominant players in, in, in India was both of these companies, even though that there was a lot of rivalry that, that was going on in India, these two companies were the dominant players. As a conclusion, after reviewing these five research papers, it is concluded that there is a relationship between the variables brand and culture. Therefore, culture is essential to build a successful marketing plan. Um, and any brand must take into consideration the cultural impacts of the society where a new product is launched. If a, if a brand was intending or planning to ex expand into a new country, they have to know the, the culture of that country that they, they are going to extend their business to before doing any of their plans. And people decide purchasing a product based on many influences and culture is one of that, those influences. Uh, these are my references, and thank you. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shahad, and today I'm going to be talking about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on consuming behavior, especially in Benghazi. So the purpose of this uh, research is to examine and observe the habits of the consuming behavior um, so, will the consumer permanently change their consumption habits due to lockdown, social distancing, or will they go back to their habits uh, once the global crisis is over? Or will there be new habits consumers will acquire due to new regulations related to air travel, shopping at the shopping centers, and attending concerts and sports events? So apparently the COVID-19 pandemic has completely changed the world in how it functions nowadays from colleagues switching online, retailers closing their doors and many other changes. Consumers have been reacting differently to this pandemic where some people were stacking up on hygiene and sanitary products out of anxiety and fear. They were like different buying strategies for consumers were implemented only to adjust the with the pandemic and online shopping has been never been uh, sorry online shopping has never been more convenient um all conception is location and time bond time bound um consumers develop habits over time about what to consume like uh, why consumption is habitual it is also contextual so context matters, and there are four major contexts which govern or disrupt consumer habits. So the first is change in the social context by such life events like marriage, um, having children, and moving from one city to another. So the social context include workplace, the community, neighbors, and also your friends. The second context is technology, and as this breakthrough technology, these breakthrough technologies emerge, they break the old habits. 
So just to conclude, uh, the lockdown and social distancing to combat the COVID-19 virus has generated significant disruptions on consumer behavior. All consumption is time bound and location and bound, as I said previously. What time flexibility but location rigidity consumers have learned to improvise in creative and in innovative ways. The work-life boundaries are now blurred as people work at home, study at home, and also like relax at home. Since the consumer is unable to go to the store, so the store has to come to the home. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Hope um, you guys understood what I said. And thank you very much. Hello everyone. Today, Mohamed El Madi and I, Munir Misuri, will be presenting our poster titled The Extent of Applying International Financial Reporting Standards in Private Sector Companies Within Libya. These are the contents we are going to cover. To begin with IFRS, IFRS is a set of global accounting standards developed by International Accounting Standards Board to address the need for international comparability in terms of financial reporting by small and medium enterprises, or SMEs in short. Moving on to a research problem, after some research, we discovered that unlike developed countries, SMEs in, in undeveloped countries do not apply the IFRS due, due to uh, technical uh, obstacles. In the research objectives, our first objective was to find out if SMEs in Libya apply the IFRS strategy and, uh, and if they understand it. And the second objectives, we wanted to provide some insights of applying on applying uh, the IFRS in undeveloped countries. And to research contribution, our paper contributes to an, uh, to an understanding of the particularities of accounting in different emerging economies and the role of IFRS for SMEs and of accounting education for the economic development of such countries. Now we're moving on to data methodology and data collection with uh, Mohanad. Methodology and data collection. Now when we first came up with the IFRS idea for a poster, we wanted to conduct some research on the matter, but we couldn't due to lack of information sources. And that's when we decided to develop our own survey slash questionnaire to conduct our own research. We got information on over 30 different private living companies, and we discovered the following. There was absence of clear understanding of IFRS when SMEs in the living private sector, weak quality of accounting information represented in the financial reports prepared by SMEs in Libya. There were uh, cost burdens of the implementation process on SMEs within the private sector, and there was a lack of trade accountants and financial experts. Now, moving on to the conclusion, did you know that small and medium-sized enterprises represent over 95% of companies worldwide? And with that being said, rem the remaining percentage covers the undeveloped countries. And so the purpose of this paper is to educate SMEs in undeveloped countries, including Libya. Now, our study provides evidence that there are conceptual problems in the current regulations of the Libyan emerging economy. And these regulations are influenced by economic, social, historical, and political structures of Libya. Moving on, now we, during our journey, we did run into some limitations, which include time issues and financial issues. Uh, these are our references. Thank you for your attention. And Thank you for all. Hello everyone, my name is Maria Merifay and I will talk about strategic human resource management supervised by Mr. Nirag Gupta. At the first, human resource management is a function of uh, organization uh, designed to maximize employee, uh, employee performance, managing and organizing most valuable assets. 
uh, so the HRM department, one of the most uh, departments uh, within any organization. Uh, okay, what is the strategic human resource management or SHRM? Uh, any company or organization has a strategy such as cost leadership uh, or differentiation. Uh, so the strategic human resource management uh, is the connection between uh, HRM department and uh, this is strategy. This HRM used to uh, achieve uh, organization goals and objectives. Okay, HRM between past and uh, and present. Uh, in the past, HRM was dominated by transactional work such as such as payroll and benefit administration. But now, due to globalization. Uh, uh, technological advancement uh, and other factors, uh, uh, the HRM now plays a big role uh, in the organization. Okay, the aim of SHRM, the essential aim of SHRM uh, is to create a constant competitive advantage. Uh, the rules of SHRM. Uh, first, employee value proposition, strategic workforce planning, uh, recruitment and selection, uh, training, performance management, uh, the 360 uh, degree feedback, total rewards, uh, succession planning, retention management, HR audits. Okay, uh, we, uh, they, uh, then we have why strategic human resource management important. Strategic human resource management uh, carries out analysis of employees uh, and determines the action required to increase their value to the company. Uh, and uh, the, the strategic human resource management address uh, employees' weakness and strength. Uh, okay, uh, uh, there are benefits of strategic human resource management. Uh, increase uh, number one increase job satisfaction to better work culture uh, three improve the rates of customer satisfaction uh, three efficient uh, resource management uh, efficient resource management mm, uh, five uh, pro uh, proactive approach to managing employees uh, and the last uh, six and the last boost productivity uh, uh, in the conclusion, strategic human resource management, uh, resource management is the link between the management of a human resource uh, to the organization's business strategy, where uh, SHRM improve the, improves uh, the organization's performance and increase the level of uh, competition with other companies. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Lubna Lushani. I'm a student in the Faculty of Business Administration, Limo, and today I will be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the banking sector. So as we all know, COVID-19's first emergence or appearance was in Wuhan, specifically in December of 2019. It is a global pandemic that spread worldwide and across all countries. It affected a lot of organizations and industries. Uh, negatively and positively. However, today we'll be talking about the results we found uh, and how COVID-19 impacted specifically the banking sector. So COVID-19 actually impacted the financial, uh, financial markets or the financial system due to its enormous economic costs. However, it did affect it also in positive ways. Um, but this is depending on whether the country was a developed or, an, an, uh, or a still developing country. So the data was collected from analyzing and um, reading previous articles and similar articles on the topic or on a related topic and also as well as uh, conducting research and analyzing the data set of the MSCI, which is a, a financial organization and a global provider of stock prices, bonds and other financial data. So uh, we're going to talk about how the COVID-19 impacted uh, countries and the banking sector positively and negatively. So first we're going to talk about Libya and how it affected our banking system and it did affect it in a negative way uh, because customers or civilians were not able to use the services that the bank provided 
due to the uh, COVID-19 and the quarantine we were in and the lack of the online banking system. So customers were not able to actually use the services that the bank provides. However, if you look at America, a developed country, there was also uh, there was already a online banking system. So customers did manage to um, to do their errands and to benefit from the uh, benefit from the service that the bank provides. They were able to, for example, take loans online or purchase their stuff uh, via Visa card or credit card on online stores. Uh, if we look at Europe, for example, they also managed to go through the crisis or like some countries uh, in Europe managed to go through that crisis and their banking system was not that affected due to um, as well providing an online banking system that customers could use where there was no human interaction needed. However, in a negative way, um, however, in a negative way, this impacted the employees that work in banks as there was a high rate of unemployment due to uh, employees losing their jobs because there was already an online banking system and civilians stopped actually going directly to banks to, um, to use the services provided. Uh, there was also a reduction in the organization's or the bank's value. As we said, uh, customers stopped going directly to the bank to use its services, so everything was um, so everything was conducted online. There was no act. There was an, an, not an actual value for the bank anymore because everything was uh, to be online via apps or online stores and credit cards. There was um, no need for the. There was no need for uh, for the bank to be an intermediary for those. So, as a conclusion, uh, the pandemic did affect um, did affect the banking sector or the financial systems globally in a negative way. However, there are also some positive ways it did affect the banking sector. In, uh, for example, like it did help. Um, it did help people to develop its technology and provide other ways. There were. Um, there were a lot of um, other ways for the civilians to conduct their businesses and it did not just stop on the banking sector however they did find an alternative way which is the online banking system and in fact this is my recommendation for here uh, in libya we need to have an online banking system for us to conduct our businesses and day-to-day -day activities instead of actually having to go to the bank just to um, just to use the services uh, this is an uh, actual um, less costly way for the bank and the customers. It, of, um, it doesn't take as much time, it doesn't take as much cost. Uh, for example, the transportation to go there. Um, it's less costly in terms of actually uh, having to um, having to spend a lot of time in the bank waiting on the queues and it is also a very safe way and it uh, lessens the, the risk of getting infected as we don't need a face-to-face -face or a human interaction a direct human interaction and thank you for listening assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh First, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Muhammad Albira. My research title is The Importance of Employee Motivation in Organizations. So these are my content. Abstract introduction, examples, discussion, recommendation, conclusion, research methodology, and references. In abstract, this study investigates the impact of employee motivation in organization. So when employees are empowered and motivated, the organization will achieve its goal. Introduction. Employee motivation, one of the top priorities for most business. Well, this can make a huge effect on the company's goals because of the potential idea that the employees are applied. So basically, employee motivation is one of the top uh, of the most important factor in any organization. It's motivator itself. Motivation is more likely to energize the employee and keep them creative. 
So if every organization needs to achieve its goals, motivation is one of the keys. Here we have example to compare between Vodafone company and Medar company as we see here. So Vodafone companies from several years ago has provided internet access to this SIM card so you can use it on your phone. The companies also provide internet to the huge companies and houses. There also has a USB flash that requires internet so you can carry it wherever you want. On the other hand, that other companies haven't provided some of these improvements. Well, only in two years ago, the company started to provide the SIM card internet. Plus, the employees are still in the same place and they aren't being promoted or even the salaries don't change. Unlike the Vodafone companies, every year their employees get promoted and their salaries get higher and they also hire new employees every year. Remuneration is one of the most important things in, in organization to motivate the employee. So remunerations means that any amount of income that's uh, paid to the person or employee to provide motivation for them, such as sound salary, good working environment, job enhancement, bonus, benefits, and advancement. All of these are provide motivation for employee to continue their job. Recommendations. In recommendations, we have a seven thing that make employee motivated. In court feedback, recognize and reward it for good work, employee development, employee promotion, employees motivations, more understanding of classification, better teamwork. In conclusion, employee motivations, as I said, Previously, motivation is a very important factor to build a creative community and organizations. So, behind every successful organization is a very supportive environment. These are my research methodology. And these are my references. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Shahda Zanati, I'm a colleague Karim Booker. Today we'll be, co we'll be covering the impact of the corona pandemic on the operation management in educational institution. As we all know that education plays a key role to the, to the society, that's why we choose this topic. Um, content, the impact of COVID-19 in education, distance learning, problem-faced e-learning, results of student survey, uh, and finally the conclusion. As we all know that COVID-19 has a huge impact, negative impact um, in, the, in everything, especially in education sector. During the pandemic, all schools and universities are closed. That's why they were trying to find a solution for this problem. So the only solution they found that the e-learning. E-learning had tools, the, the, the main, the main, yeah, uh, the main, uh, the main tool that, um, portal, uh, Zoom meetings, and uh, online sessions. So with this tool, they covered the problem and they made the students carry on the semester and don't stop it. As you can see this picture, uh, it, uh, we asked the students about the challenges that they faced with the e-learning. Um, with the e-learning, so the issues is not going to be the same for the other universities, but especially for the Lima students. So the three main issues were um, um, the three main issues were the culture, uh, electricity issues, and uh, internet issues. So they were talking about culture too much. Culture, the, um, it was a new experience for them. They were not familiar to use. Um, to use e-learning, uh, but then uh, they, when, when, when they get familiar with it, they find it helpful. And uh, now my colleague Karim, he will carry on. Hello everybody. 
So I will be discussing with you the results that I have collected from the survey based on the students' opinion from different parts across the world. So we created a five question survey in which includes a multiple, some multiple choice uh, and short essays to be able to have a better understanding of uh, why the students feel this way, to have a better data to work with. So the first question was, what is the level of your knowledge of the COVID-19 pandemic? The reason why I, uh, why I asked, uh, why the, uh, sorry, the reason why I start with this question because I wanted to see where the students stand and how knowledgeable they are about the COVID-19, since every country deals with the pandemic differently. So we got uh, 48 responses. The majority of the answers was uh, around three and four out of out of five. The second question: Do you think that the e-learning has a good impact during the COVID-19? Also, most of the answers from the first question, the students agreed that they have a similar knowledge. However, here we see that the students have completely different opinions. The majority approved that the online education solution and the, uh, and the second majority don't know how to feel about it or they stand somewhere in the middle. And the minority, which only represent less than 10%, as we can see here. Third question was, how satisfied are the students with the e-learning resources available? Here we, can, here we can see the diversity of the answers perhaps show how students from different parts across the world are provided with different tools. On this pie chart, we can see that the majority of the answers was satisfied. On the other hand, we can see that nobody was satisfied. Okay, the flexibility of online education. Most of the students on the survey agreed that the schedule was somewhat flexible during the previous semester. So we can see here in this chart, we, the, you know, the majority of the answers was around three and four out of five. The last question was, how satisfied are the students with the overall knowledge they gained compared to the normal status, which is university attendance? Also, online learning can be a little bit tricky. For example, um, uh, science, uh, science classes sometimes require face-to-face -face interaction for better learning. However, based on the student's answer, where they say they're still learning just as, as much as they would have in class, which means that the school uh, are putting good effort, uh, effort into maintaining a quality of the education. And uh, my classmate Shahed will take you over from here and wrap things up. In general, the outbreak of COVID-19 has greatly affected the operation of the universities and colleges, uh, which have uh, rendered most of the students unable to complete their course on time. So that's why they, uh, they transfer to the e-learning. Is there any questions? Thank you for listening. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Brahim Al-Abbar, a student in the business faculty at the Libyan International University. And in this video, I'll be presenting my presentation, which is titled as the financial system and economic development in Libya. Contents is research objective and methodology and data collection, then introduction, uh, financial system contribution, conclusion, recommendation, and finally, my references. My research objective was to study the role and importance of the financial system in economic development. And the data and information for this research are collected from secondary sources such as journals, books, documentaries, and websites. To begin with, the financial system main function is to channel funds from savers such as households, to investors such as 
business firms or corporations. And through this main function is where the creation of wealth happens for both parties. And eventually leading to overall economic development. The financial system contributes to the development of the economy in many different ways. And I chose to discuss with you four ways, which are how it assists in raising capital, how it assists the government in raising funds, and how it supports infrastructure and employment growth. The financial system induces the public, who are you and I, to save a portion of their salaries in order to invest. And it does this through the provision of attractive interest rates. Such savings are then channelized by lending to different firms who are looking to raise capital in order to be more productive. Moving on <clears throat> to how the financial system assists the government. Okay, it also assists the government in many different ways, and I've chose to talk about two ways. First, the financial system helps the government to collect short-term and long-term funds by issuing bills and bonds that bear attractive interest rates. The second way, every government experiences what's known as a budgetary gap when its expenses exceeds its budget. It's left with a gap known as a terminology budgetary gap. And only with the aid of the state stock market is this gap filled. Okay, next is the infrastructure growth. In the absence of main industries such as oil, power and coal, um, which was our case in Libya when the army seized the production of oil, and Libya is, as we all know, highly dependent on this industry, where it represents 95% of export earnings and 60% of total GDP, a gross domestic product. And in the absence of this industry, the Libyan government should look to the financial system because it assists in the provision of funds for the development of the infrastructure sector. <clears throat> Up next is employment growth. Now, if we look back to the section where the financial system aids in raising capital, once it assists companies or corporations in raising capital, corporation increases their production. And the only way they can increase their production is through increasing their labor force, which ultimately then leads to the increasement of uh, employment rate or the reduction of unemployment. In conclusion, it can be stated that a financial system provides a platform to the lenders and borrowers to interact with one another for their mutual benefits. The, ult the ultimate profits of this interaction come in the form of capital accumulation and economic development of a country. <clears throat> I recommend that the Libyan government should further develop the financial system to support the development of financial markets and to develop competent regulated bodies for the sake of independence from the petroleum sector. These are my references. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fahad Hussain. Today I'll be presenting my poster regarding the scientific day of the Faculty of Business Administration. So my poster is speaking about the determinants of Libyan buying buyer behavior during the curfew. My instructor was Dr. Ezzedine Busnina, and I'll be starting right now. As for my introduction, we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has started and has caused the lockdown and social distance mandates that have disturbed the consumer's habit of buying as well as shopping. 
consumers, on the other hand, are still struggling how to adapt their habits to such situations and learn, of course, new behavioral aspects. For example, consumers cannot go to the stores, so the stores comes home or comes to the consumers. <clears throat> but old behaviors die hard. However, consumers have no choice but modify their habits and new regulations. Also, new habits have also emerged because of technology advancement, social, social, um, uh, sorry, internet advancements and uh, social media and everything. So as we know, changing demographics and innovation as well, part of it. Consumers are bu consuming buyer behavior is the most obvious behavioral aspects that have influenced by the pandemic procedures. As in Libya, the difficult pandemic situation has come alongside with the economical instability and civil unrest. Studying Libyan consumers' behavior is now an imperative that researchers can no longer ignore. Therefore, this research paper aims to investigate the determinants of Libyan buying consumer behavior during the curfew times. As for the second part, which is the effects of COVID-19 on consumers' behavior, here we can see we have three factors that are affecting here. First of all, the beginning of the curfew the total and the total lockdown, there was a notice increase in spending on groceries, food items, and hygiene products. Of course, all of that is indication for many more information we will be seeing later on. <clears throat> second of all, there was a massive decrease in consumer spending on restaurants, cafes, sports activities. Uh, third of all, during the COVID-19 curfew, a rise in consumer concern has led to change around the most, base and the most basic needs, sending demand more for hygiene and cleaning products. During the pandemic, people are spending less of their income on items perceived as nice to have or non-essentials, such as clothing, shoes, electronics, and games, of course. And we'll be seeing why all of that's happening. So we have two categories here, which actually business is affected by uh, during the curfew. We have categories that increase and have uh, as demands, and we have uh, categories that decrease demands on. So if we see here the categories that increase demands on, which are online education or online work, people start actually working from their home through the uh, internet, which is online. People start uh, universities had actually uh, programs that uh, allow students to study online from their houses or through uh, from their home during the pandemic of uh, curfew. Uh, we have uh, actually an increase in the increase of demand in the internet services as well. People started uh, paying more through the uh, more to internet services during the time that they're spending in their uh, in their houses and during the time of curfew. Third of all, we have healthcare and pharmaceutical products actually increased, and groceries, of course, as products. On the other hand, in, in my right screen here, in the right here, we have uh, categories that decreased, which are uh, demands on, which are the restaurants, cosmetics, cars, vacation and travel, current furniture, and clothing as well. We'll be explaining why all of that actually happened. I've made actually uh, surveys through uh, Google Meets, through uh, social media, and uh, emails. The following data was collected from surveys which were distributed online to between 48 to 50 people uh, through social media and emails. The, actually, the surveys were actually focused on the following factors, which are four factors. Uh, products which were bought during the curfew, usage of internet during the curfew, the increase of online activity during the curfew, and of course the personal concerns about or over COVID-19. So the first of all, uh, the first question or the first factor here actually uh, concerned about the uh, actually focused on the uh, most products that have bought during the curfew as we can see here we have a couple of products here several products here and the uh, and the statistical uh, information so the top of the list the first and the top of the list product was hygiene product people were like buying hygiene products consumers were buying consu uh, hygiene products all the time during the curfew which are 78 percent here Second of the list was the internet services, as uh, recharging cars and more. So here we can see that these indications give us straight information about what happened during the curfew and what people actually uh, do regarding their demand and how that demand shifted away from couple of, from products, normal products, and how the behavior actually changed from certain products to another products here. Third of all, people started buying, 62% uh, of people buying groceries uh, and food in bulk, of course. Cleaning products was uh, the fourth on the uh, on the list with uh, 36%. Of course, uh, 
course, cosmetics only had 12%. Uh, clothing didn't have much, only 2%. Stocks and cryptocurrencies, 2% only. And from here, we can go to section two, which is, has the internet, has the use of internet helped during the curfew? 87.5% said yes, they did. And the third sector here, which is uh, the usage increased, uh, in, sorry, since the COVID-19 outbreak started. Using social media was on the top of the list. People were, 87.5% of people said uh, using social media has helped them and has actually, uh, the, that usage actually increased during the outbreak started, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that gives an indication for businesses that social media can be and will be uh, the next generation for businesses and how actually to promote and exist on social media, how businesses should shift away from that from actually being rather than being uh, only physical. And that's a really wow. good point here. We'll be discussing later on as well. Watching movies and series online was 50%, which uh, gives people that the ability to see that uh, people were spending time alone or with family uh, during the lockdown, during the breakdown, they were spending time actually watching movies or series online, uh, learning practices, learning or practicing habits as well, playing games on uh, mobile devices and all of that factors here. The, first, the fourth and the last uh, factor here or sector was uh, the concerns that uh, consumers or, uh, or people actually were concerned about regarding the COVID-19 was uh, to, those are the factors here or those are the concerns. 26.4% was uh, being or being or someone in my household becomes uh, affected. Uh, that's that, that was the that was the most cons uh, concern factor for consumers. And we can see here that 18.9% here was the impact on my job security. People were uh, were afraid and were concerned about uh, their jobs and what would happen. And from here we can see that 17% of people were concerned about the impact on the economy. Uh, here we have several and a couple of uh, factors concerns consumers as uh, an ability to see friends or family, uh, 9.4, sorry, here was where people were concerned about school being closed and being late to graduate and everything. That data would be analyzed, that data should be analyzed uh, correctly. So the first section of the survey covered information about the most products which were bought during the curfew. And that result showed actually a massive increase in the following. Hygiene products actually was 78%, internet services 70%, and grocery products 62%. The second, uh, second part of the survey focused on the usage of the internet has helped during the curfew time. That results were actually 80.7% uh, said yes, no, no, actually 4.2%, and only 8.3 people said maybe. The third section of the survey concentrated concentrated on the media consumption. Great number actually of consumers, which is 87.5% uh, have increased their usage of, of uh, social media, and half of consumers, actually 50%, have increased their consumption of watching uh, movies or series online since the pandemic started. Uh, of course, the uh, consumption, consumption of uh, playing games on mobile devices or tablets showed greater increase than playing games on computer. Even non-digital media types like magazine or newspapers or books are seeing an increase uh, in usage, of course. While consumers may not be out and physically, of course, there are still numerous opportunities for brands and retailers to connect with them through various media types. We here will be speaking about how, how businesses should uh, retarget their uh, target market and how to, uh, sorry, uh, distribution channel and how they use that distribution channel to reach for their uh, consumers. And that's a very good point here. Panadamic has showed us how that uh, actually helped us through uh, through the pandemic and brands actually were there showing the improvement and enhancement and of how brands actually reach and stand out for their consumers during the pandemic, of course. The fourth section of the survey was concerned over COVID-19. The fear of being someone being or someone in my household becomes infected was on the top of the list. As we said earlier, this followed closely by economical impacts, concern on my job security and being unable to purchase needs. The results and discussions here in mid-March 2020, lockdown was declared by the government and suddenly changes occurred in the consumer behavior. 
after the declaration of first lockdown, all shops of essential commodities were crowded with consumers. That was actually a problem because all of the uh, shopkeepers to manage uh, couldn't actually manage a huge crowd who came to purchase essential goods as groceries, hygiene products, and many more. And that was a problem uh, regarding supply chain management inside of uh, retail uh, shops or shopping malls or whatever. So in that, it became difficult to the shopkeeper to manage a huge crowd who became uh, who, come, who came actually to purchase essential goods. Rumors were widely spreading through the social media. Over there, consumers were in focus in the state of mind due to the shortage of goods in the market. Consumers were refocused for the application of preventive measures. And of course, rumors were widely spreading through the social media, of course. Consumers, on the other hand, were in a confused state of mind due to the shortage of goods. Uh, face masks and everything was actually uh, decreased in the market and lacked uh, of, of such products. On the other hand, government arranged more attention to, for, to fight against COVID-19. Instructions were given, of course, to the consumers to obey rules and regulations while entering for purchase and essential goods. The findings here, you can say that from the present research, it was observed that the social distancing was one of the safeguards against COVID-19. It helps to break the chain of spread diseases. And then, of course, during the research, uh, it was found that the lockdown period consumer behavior was, has, was actually highly susceptible. From this study, it was found that the different factors were affecting on the consumer buying behavior in the lockdown situation. It was also found that the government has attempted to build wider communication bridges, creating actually awareness among the consumers. My recommendation, my personal recommendation, which I learned and which I uh, think it should be happening are two actually, which are there should be an online awareness for the transaction habits among the consumers to avoid uh, the effect of COVID-19 disease. By that, I mean uh, government or any uh, organization should actually uh, make campaigns of awareness for consumers to understand how the impact and how actually uh, the information and how to educate the uh, how to educate consumers, a buyer or people to learn uh, the awareness of uh, of the online of the uh, sorry of the transactions habits uh, among the consumers. Number two, it is recommended from this research study that after COVID nineteen. Uh, numer uh, sorry, big or numerous effects on consumers' behavior and the noted increase in the time spent online, on social media, of course, companies should try to appear and exist more online. That gives them actually the next, uh, that gives them a huge uh, boom and a huge peak and uh, gives them an, uh, the, uh, how can I say it, a step actually forward and being uh, initiative against other competitive, against other competitors. It is the, as it is the next environment for businesses to come. This is, this is my final thing, which is the conclusion. COVID-19 forced shops around the world to shut for months and recently reopened, of course, under strict and new guidelines. On the other hand, the, uh, the time in the lockdown was, has caused an, uh, an e-commerce boom or an e-commerce uh, peak, with the pandemic accelerating the shift away from physical stores to online, of course. E-commerce is, e is expected to grow by nearly 20% in 2020, and that actually study was uh, that data actually was from IBM's U.S. retail Inditex. As the COVID-19 pandemic reshapes our world, more consumers have begun actually shopping online in greater numbers and frequencies. Here we have a great example of uh, the brand Zara actually uh, shut down 50% of their uh, physical stores online, uh, offline, which are physical stores around the world globally. And they said our message is, is to expect. The, uh, the increase of people and the increase of the, of the demand online. That happened actually during the curfew and now they started doing such a thing. It's a great opportunity for people to start existing and being online. On the other hand, brands that created solutions against COVID-19 to carry on its work showed a significant increase in its reputation and brand value and brand images, of course. Here we have an example of universities which use Google Meeting, Google Classrooms, or universities that already had uh, their own digital platforms as uh, Moodle, as our university had did for us. It's a great uh, example. Customers are trying their best to adapt to strange times without uh, a lot of foothold, uh, sorry, footholds and shifting their behaviors. As a result, businesses are facing much of the same uncertainty while trying to, while to support their customers' wants or needs, of course, and their own. E-commerce could be the next zone for lots of firms to be in the race of new business worlds. 
these are the references that I have used, and I would like to actually thank uh, our faculty for giving us such an uh, opportunity to show our ability in researches and scientific day. Uh, I would love to give uh, my acknowledgement for Dr. Azim Busnain and Dr. Sabri actually for helping us and supporting us. Thank you so much. My name is Faiq Hussain, and that was actually my presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Anmar Nasr Bousakouk and my presentation today is about the motivation and demotivation of e-learning during the pandemic. As we all know, the coronavirus pandemic is beginning to reshape almost every aspect in our world. And that includes education, schools, high institutions, they're all closing down. Millions of students are stuck at home and have been turning to online education, or as we call it, e-learning. So once in a lifetime opportunity, or perhaps even a once in a century opportunity, that changed how we might view things or even work on things. While focusing on our country, in Libya specifically, we have systems which are not very adaptable or even flexible. We've built an infrastructure that relies on traditional classroom or face-to-face -face learning. Because of that, we're not very adaptable to changing circumstances. However, now because of the pandemic, higher institutions had no other choice but to resort to e-learning. My case study for this research is my own university, uh, Libya International Medical University, also known as LIMO. LIMO was one of the first, and if I'm not mistaken, possibly the only um, high institution that has taken on e-learning in the city of Benghazi the previous semester. It was a great experience for me personally. However, I noticed that the majority did not enjoy it as much as I perceived them to have. Nonetheless, I think it was an experience uh, we all had to at least try out. Um, moving on, with such limited people enjoying this new educational journey, I decided, to make, I decided to make a survey based on whether a student or an instructor finds e-learning as a motivating factor or as a demotivating factor. Does it motivate you into continuing your studies or teaching, or does it demotivate you? And by that, uh, I got 50 responses. So you can see here on the pie chart in front of you, the results indicate that it was voted 13.8% as a motivating factor. 44.8% as a demotivating factor, and 41.4% goes to uh, both factors being applied, which is honestly not the results I was expecting, but I had to take on uh, into consideration of the demotivating factors that have so deeply burdened the majority to the point of it having a 44.8% uh, advantage over other choices, which are, I'm gonna keep it brief, uh, power outings, internet cuts, and some felt like they were neglected being in a web-based uh, environment, an e-learning environment. Some felt like they had a short attention span, they couldn't focus with just a screen in front of them. With a lecture being recorded, they, they felt like they weren't learning as much as they would in a classroom environment. Uh, but overall, I don't mean to be biased, but I personally think e-learning has its advantages and disadvantages. It just depends on your location. For example, if we lived in the Netherlands, we wouldn't experience power outings, internet cuts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It just depends, I think, on your personal will, whether you're up for it or not. In conclusion, I personally think that with the pandemic going on, some students feeling neglected with e-learning that High institutions should consider blended learning, which is basically a mix with e-learning and traditional face-to-face -face learning. Um, it is said that uh, blended learning, with caution, of course, taken with caution, during this pandemic uh, would create a more comfortable environment for the majority of students, for the majority of instructors even, and it's a more stable learning environment when done with caution. I think the majority would agree with me on that, hence why both factors being applied had such a high percentage as well, uh, moving, uh, going on to 41.4% of both factors being applied a mix between e-learning and traditional classroom uh, learning. Ending things on a final note, I hope that the COVID-19 situation is solved and everything goes back to normal, which is highly, highly, highly doubtful with the pandemic influencing great change in our lives. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope everyone and anyone that is listening has enjoyed as much as I enjoyed here today. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Zara Wazan. Today I'm going to talk about quality management in healthcare. 
the contents of my presentation includes quality definition, quality dimension, quality management system stages, management system certification, some of ISO standards relevant to healthcare stages of ISO certification at UPC in Polyclinic Benghazi, gap analysis, sample of non conformity reports, conclusion, and the reference. Quality can be defined as meeting and exceeding the customer's requirements and expectations and preferences. What but the question is what are the customer who are the, sorry, who are the customers of healthcare and what their requirements and expectations? But the main customers are the patient and the main requirement is the quality with dimension. What's the quality dimensions in healthcare in healthcare management? Effectiveness Number one, effectiveness, which include completeness and timelines, efficiency, which include accuracy and cost effective and patient centric. And the third one, compliance, which include which include free of error and knowledge of self -care. Here we have the stages of quality management. The first stage, the first stage, quality control, which means error detection, and the second stage, quality assurance, which means error prevention, both of them together mean quality management. And remember that quality management system requirement means quality requirements related to QC and QA, which mean error prevention and error detection both together. Here we have some of ISO standards relevant to healthcare environment, ISO 4001, prevention and detection of uh, pollution and uh, waste management and quality, which means provide customers with confirming goods and service to enhance customer satisfaction and safety, prevention and detection of accident. And here we have discussions and results at Abensina Bolo Clinic. First of all, we have the stages of ISO certification at Abensina Bolo Clinic Benghazi. Number one, gap analysis and pre-audit by accredited certification body. Number two is determination of 34 non-conformity reports. Number three, determ determ determining the causes of this non-conformity. Most of them was by the system. And number four, developing of 30 procedures and instructions to ensure implementing ISO requirement in medical service. Number five, closing out the the, four, the, 40, sorry, the 34 non-conformity reports. Number six, implementing of internal audit and management review. Number seven, auditing by certification body. Number nine, issue of accredited certificates. Number 10, follow up to maintain certifications. And here we have sample of non-conformity reports. Number one, some of medical liberty device were not calibrated according to it, to its separation and maintain maintain maintains manual. And there is no training for internal auditors. The medical protocol were maintained but not controlled. Uh, no relation between training plan and the exist the existed problems. Some of staff working in radiographic areas are not wear cl protective clothes. Cost of human mistakes was not determ determined. No dealing with customers' complaints at all. No key performance indicators. Some MRI scan and X-ray report are not backed up for reference. Posters are not controlled. And here we have the reference. And thank you for watching. Hello, my name is Ustral Muaddab, a tutor at the Faculty of Business Administration, and today I'll be presenting Problem-Based Learning, PBL. Uh, we'll start off with our table of content. We have introduction, the history, the process of PBL, comparison and advantages, and lastly, we have our conclusion. Okay, uh, Dr. Boros defined PBL as students learning by solving their uh, solving problems and reflecting on their ex uh, experiences. Uh, what we mean by uh, solving problems are scenarios students have to deal with in each brainstorming session uh, and they have to work on them with their peers. If we go back to the history of uh, PBL, we have the, in 1969, it first started in the Canadian University of McMaster in the medical field. 
Later on in years, it was introduced in social studies, economics school, and uh, business school as well. Uh, if we look here, this is a uh, picture from the classrooms we have at the university where students are sitting in a U-shaped class. Uh, we have three roles that are generally taken in the brainstorming session. Uh, we have our leader who sits in the middle and leads the groups while uh, in the session. We have our scribe who writes on the board uh, the objectives that were found in the uh, brainstorming, uh, in the scenario they, they were handed. And lastly, we have our discussants who are sitting in to discuss the scenarios that they have. Ideally, groups are uh, ranging from eight to 10 students uh, in each. Uh, next, uh, we move on to, uh, this is a picture from last term's uh, PBL session. Uh, students had to do their session or had to have their sessions online due to the pandemic and they will use a virtual platform to discuss their presentations, uh, to discuss their scenarios, sorry. Moving on, we have uh, the process of PGL. Students, are, uh, as we said, students are handed their uh, scenarios. They have objectives in which they have to find. Later on, when they finish the session, they have to go home and start their searching process. Uh, that could be done over the internet, over uh, sources or books that, uh, that they already have or, uh, on their Moodle. Uh, later on, they attend their lecture. Uh, they attend their lectures and get to discuss the information that uh, were found off of the internet. Uh, and what's so special about this is that students are already familiar with the content of the lecture rather than uh, being struck with, all, uh, with the information for the first time. Uh, later on, they have to prepare a PowerPoint presentation to present in the debriefing session. Now that they're all ready and set for the debriefing session, uh, we have here students, uh, they don't consume the same roles they did in the past. Instead, they're all just sitting and listening to each person at a time presenting their objective. Uh, yes, their students are very encouraged, uh, very much highly encouraged uh, to uh, ask each other questions, to check their uh, peers' understanding of the objective they had to search for. Uh, uh, as well, this is as well from last uh, term's uh, PBL debriefing session, where students uh, had to present their objectives and others would have to accordingly listen. Uh, the process of PBL. If we were to discuss this in a more pedagogical way, uh, the knowledge which, uh, which is our ultimate goal turns into a tool where students uh, get to build up their knowledge uh, each and every week. Uh, learners are not just passive, they're not just being fed the information. Instead, they are active, they're actually the ones uh, seeking them. And lastly, we have our teachers. They're not just directives, they're not just telling students what to do. Instead, uh, they're working more as coaches and training students to obtain the information themselves. Uh, the advantages we have, it's a student-centered learning approach. Uh, students, as we said, get to do most of the work uh, as they search for it online and later on discuss it with their instructors. Uh, they maintain lifelong learning. Uh, it's, uh, it's commonly known and proven that all the information uh, that are uh, searched for uh, are more likely to stay rather than the are maintained rather than the information they are spoon fed. Uh, we have learning in context. As we said, the scenarios have integrated courses together. And they're not just learning each discipline at a time. Instead, they are uh, integrated together. They're activating prior knowledge. Uh, the fact that they are uh, held every week students get to build up uh, the knowledge uh, gradually uh, so starting the first week they get to uh, use the knowledge and that they used in the third and second uh, second weeks uh, and activating with them uh, lastly it's a cooperative learning approach uh, students get to learn this in teams rather than learning each information on their own uh, lastly, we have our conclusion. We said PBL represents a shift from lecture-based learning to a more student-centered one, uh, and they are giving the chance to produce uh, and practice life uh, real-world problems.
Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Hello everyone, my name is Fatma Saleh. I'm a tutor at the Libyan International Medical University Faculty of Business Administration. My topic today will be the 101 PBL tutoring, means the basics of PBL tutoring. Um, as we know, Libyan International Medical University is known for its new kind of teaching methods um, here in Libya. And one of these, one of these methods of teaching process is PBL. My contents will be an introduction for PBL, PBL sessions, goals of PBL, PBL cycle, and difficulties in PBL, conclusion, and at last, the references. As an introduction, I'm going to define the PBL. PBL stands for problem-based learning. It is a method of teaching that presents students with a problem or challenge to solve. So they have the scenarios or a material and they try to figure out and brainstorm um, a solution for it. And it requires them to gather information from various resources. So they try to gather information about this objective that they chose and then come up with a solution in a product or a performance as a presentation in front of the group. So PBL is divided into two, session, two sessions sorry, weekly. The first session is brainstorming and the second session is debriefing. So the brainstorming, it is a group discussion to produce ideas or solve problems. Here the students take the scenarios and choose a leader that leads the group and a scribe who writes down the objectives that they came up with. In the debriefing, here the students present the information, information that they gather. So it is to interrogate someone in order to obtain useful information. They present it in, as a PowerPoint in a presentation in front of their group. Goals of PBL. Construct an extensive and flexible knowledge base. They, beca they become more flexible in gathering information. Foster increased retention of uh, knowledge. They'll increase their, their ability of memorizing. Develop self-direction, lifelong learning skills. They become self-taught. Develop an, ab an ability to identify relevant problems. They put, the right, they put the right information in the right place. Here in the P PBL cycle, we'll know how the PBL goes. First thing is state the problem and then generate ideas. We select a solution and then build an item, evaluate, and then come up with the results. Difficulties in PBL unprepared for the tutorial. When the tutor haven't read the scenario or the student uh, isn't ready to present the presentation in the debriefing session. The dominating group members, it is the bossy students, which is hard. When the student is bossy, it's hard for you to listen to other students. It's not, give, not given enough time by other members when the students take more time than others and the session time ends, so other students here will not have time to present their presentations or give their opinions and something. The group that keeps storming. Um, the group that keeps breaking in into everything and here the tutor becomes, might go out of control. As a conclusion, PBL embraces the principles of good learning and teaching. It is student directed and it is student directed, which encourages um, self sufficiency and it is a preparation for lifelong learning. And it promotes active and deep learning. It is also it also I mean it also increases uh, the de the development of skills. Uh, such as um, collaboration, uh, critical thinking, and problem solving. Yeah. 
So these are my references. This was my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Hiba Rashid. I have been teaching English uh, eight years ago. I am working at International House of Benghazi. I have worked also in many other English centers. Currently, I am doing my master's degree uh, of applied linguistics. Uh, today, I will be presenting you something I hope that uh, you will enjoy listening to. But before uh, I, I start uh, giving my presentation, I just want to tell you that I have always felt truly passionate about teaching English language. Now, uh, the presentation I'm going to, to be giving to you today is about, uh, is about a site that I consider really important, uh, related, which is related to my field of teaching, the language. Uh, it's about how can we as English teachers teach grammar in such communicative, uh, effective methods. Before we get into the details of how can we use uh, the grammar in, uh, in a communicative method, or how can we teach it in communicative method, there is a question that is uh, most of the time asked by the learners and the students. Uh, they usually ask their teachers, why do we need to learn grammar? Why do we need to master the grammatical structure of English or any other language? Uh, we need to remind our students always that, uh, that Good grammar means that uh, means that people are communicating in such an effective way. Uh, good grammar encourages uh, the logical thinking. Good grammar also it has uh, a positive influence on the quality of our writing. Actually, not only in our writing, it has a positive influence on the other skills of the language, including reading, listening, speaking as well. We need also to, to, to remind our students that uh, grammar develops correctness in communication. It, form, uh, it forms the learner's brain to a pattern of order and clearness. Proper use of grammar is an indicator uh, of admiration for both speakers and learners as well, and listeners, sorry. Uh, now, we as English teachers, we are fully aware uh, about the value of the sentence structure. We know that the, the value of the sentence structure cannot be denied at all in the learner's communication. I mean, um, the goal of teaching grammar uh, communicatively, uh, uh, it means that we are helping the learner to reach a high level of communicative grammatical competence so they can use this is structure, or they, we help them to, to have the ability to, to use this structure in a variety of situations spontaneously. Now, uh, as, uh, as you can see in front of you in this slide, this communicative approach of teaching grammar aims at two things. It aims at the language knowledge, and it also aims at the knowledge of how to use the language to achieve communicative competence. Now, let's get into more details about how can we teach grammar as teachers. When it comes to teaching grammar, there are two main approaches we can use. There is an approach that's called inductive approach, and there is the other one, which is called the deductive approach. I will give you a simple definition of what's inductive approach and, and the deductive approach. Now, inductive approach uh, is considered to be a learner-centered class. A learner-centered class means that the learners, they are involved to work more than the teachers do. You let the learners work or do the jobs themselves without your help. You may help, but you're not doing the whole job. You're, you're making your students responsible for the job more than you, more than the teacher himself. As for the deductive approach, it's considered to be a teacher-centered class because uh, in this approach, the teacher is the one who's taking control of almost everything. Now, as you can see in this slide, uh, there is more explanation, simple explanation and general explanation of the inductive and the deductive. Now, when it comes to applying inductive approach, it means uh, approach. It means that the teachers, they need to provide specific examples first. Then they ask the student to infer or deduce the rule. So as you can see in here, you're asking the students to do the job themselves without your help. On the other hand, the deductive approach 
the teachers, they overtly explain the rule. So they're doing the most of the job themselves. They overtly explain the rule. Then they provide more example if it's needed to reinforce the target language that they're trying to teach to the students. So in this case, which is the deductive approach, we're not asking the students to work uh, as much as we are asking them to work in the inductive approach. The teacher, as I've mentioned, is doing most of the job in the deductive approach. Let's have more details about these two approaches in the other uh, slide. Now, uh, I, I gave you a general definition of what's the inductive and the deductive approach. Now, as we all know, each approach in, in the field of teaching, it has its pros and cons. Uh, the same thing as for inductive and the deductive approach. Now, let's have a look let's have a look sorry at the pros of the inductive approach now uh, when it comes to applying the inductive approach in your classroom it means that you're making your students responsible for discovering the rules themselves so it's a self-discovered rules we, we, i mean in the classroom and as long as you're asking the students to do the job themselves understand the rules themselves i mean they can do that in a pair worker group work this becomes more memorable for them. It sticks to their mind because you give them the permission to do the job themselves without your help. So it becomes more memorable for, for the students. And uh, uh, I have witnessed that in my classroom hundreds of times. Uh, as for the second course we have, if you are applying or, or, or if you're using this approach in your classroom, it means you are encouraging the independent learning. You're asking or you're teaching your students how can they be responsible to, to, to think themselves? How can they be responsible to, to express their opinion, to discover the rules themselves, to, to look for better solutions so they can simplify and, uh, and, and understand the rules themselves without the teacher's help? They can do that, again, in a pair or group work. Uh, as for the cons for the inductive approach, uh, it could be a time consuming because as long as you're asking the students to work on their own without your help, it means you are you, you need to have more time in, I mean, for your class. Uh, sometimes, I, from my own experience, um, I mean, uh, when I ask the students to do, to do the job uh, in, in a group work or pair work, sometimes uh, students face such complicated rules. I can see, uh, you know, uh, the frustration uh, on their faces because they couldn't uh, understand the rules themselves. So this might lead to confusion and frustration. I mean, this ha this does, uh, doesn't happen like all the time. Uh, for example, they have the passive voice, uh, and it happens. It happened. I mean, uh, for intermediate uh, students, uh, they usually uh, get lost using this uh, passive voice thing. So I, I find or I feel like the students um, are, are lost and they couldn't do the job themselves, so they usually ask for the teacher. So this may sometimes lead to confusion and frustration. Uh, moving uh, to uh, the next approach, which is the deductive approach. And as I've mentioned, it's uh, a teacher-centered class. Now, the pros for this one, uh, the teacher just gets to the point very quickly because he's the one who's doing the job. So if they just get to the point very, very quickly. They explain the rule very quickly without needing uh, the, the students to, to share or express or even let them uh, do the job themselves. So if you're doing, if you're getting to the point very quickly, it means that you are saving time to give them or to provide more examples. Uh, talking about the cons for the deductive approach, you as a teacher, I mean, if you've been teaching English before, you're going to feel that yourself. You're going to feel that you are teaching the grammar in such an isolated way. And sometimes you can feel uh, on your students' faces, it can feel mechanical or tedious for them because you're just presenting the rules on the board. You're not asking the students to interact with each other, to, to do something. Uh, I mean, the students, they're not involved. They just sit on their play, at their places. The teacher do the whole job, and then they give them more examples to, to reinforce uh, the, the grammatical structure. So it can feel really mechanical and tedious for the students. Uh, I have, uh, so it's going to be uh, 
clear for you about the deductive approach and inductive approach. There is another thing that we, uh, we need to know. Now, uh, English teachers, they really, really need to be uh, aware uh, about their learners. I mean, before you get into the class or before you start a course, you need to ask yourselves, who are, who are the students? What are their needs? What's their level? What's, what's their age as well? Um, of course, we're, we're not going to use the same technique. We're not going to use the same method. We're not going to use even the same material for all the learners that we were teaching. As you can see in this slide, we have three kinds of, uh, of assumptions that we need to bear in mind. The first one, we need to bear in mind that the younger the student, the less likely they are going to understand abstract concept. That's the first assumption. The second one, the lower the level, the lower the proficiency level of your student, the less likely they will be able to use intricate grammatical structure. The third assumption is about the linguistic distance between languages. The more linguistic li distance that we have between the mother tongue and the second language, the more practice the students or the learners will require. I will give you a simple example. For instance, we have Arabic and English. Now, the, the linguistic distance between Arabic and English is serious. I mean, Arabic and English, they're not, they're completely different. So in here, if we're having an Arabic learner who's, who's, who's learning English, they need to, 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 to be exposed to the language more. They need to, to practice as much as possible so they can master the language really well. But if we have an Italian, for example, and Spanish language, now the linguistic distance I mean, it's not like the one that we're having between Arabic and English because uh, they're, they're a little bit similar. I mean, like Spanish, Italian or Italian and French talking about the linguistic distance. So these three assumptions that we as English teachers, we need to be fully aware of. And the other slide, uh, now after we've talked about the inductive approach and the deductive approach, uh, we have also mentioned the assumption that we need to bear in mind about our learners. Now, let's have a look about how can we apply teaching the grammar communicatively. What steps can we follow? At the first stage, the teacher should present the grammar in context. Another thing you should keep in mind, grammar cannot be understood out of context. In other words, if you are, as an English teacher, came into your class and presented the grammatical structure in isolated sentences, then you mess things up. It's going to be complicated for, the, for your student. It's way, way better if you present the grammar in a context. It's going to be way better and it's, it's more appropriate for your student. This is the first stage, so we present the grammar in a context. The second stage, we need to focus on the function first. Now, usually, when you say grammar, students, they focus on the form. And, and this thing actually is not effective for, for, for them to learn or to, to acquire the, the grammatical structure that you want to learn. So the, the second stage, after presenting the grammar in a context, you need to let the students, uh, students sorry, focus on the function first. Then we move smoothly to the form. At the third stage, we have to practice the target language or the grammatical structure until you feel like your students have really mastered the grammatical structure that you were trying to teach. Uh, in the last slide in here, as you can see, we have two sides. The first side, it's about young or lower proficiency. The second side is about adults or higher proficiency. Now, as I've mentioned before, I've said that we, we're not using the same materials, techniques, and uh, methods of teaching for all learners. We need to, to differentiate between young learners, uh, adults. We need to differentiate between uh, low levels and high levels because we're not using the same techniques at all. It's, it's completely different. Um, as you can see, for the young or lower level students, what do we have to, to use? We have to use introductions first in our classroom. Then we use warms up. They are really important and they have uh, uh, effective results on the students. Uh, and then repetition. Repetition is really, really uh, required with, with, low, with lower level students or young students. Uh, more pictures. They always need more pictures, tangible examples. Uh, translation, of course, it 
to, it must be avoided as much as possible. If the, if the teacher couldn't convey like the meaning, they can mime and gesture or they can just use their body language. They just need to, to avoid uh, translating as much as they can. Question and answer, pair work or group work can be used for, for more practice for the target language. Now, when it comes to the testing stage, we're still talking about uh, the young or low, uh, lower level students. When it comes to the testing stage, we can use games. We can also use role plays. Role plays uh, are really preferred by, by the students because they interact with each other. And, uh, you know, you get the students out of their seats so you can, you can let them move around the class. Uh, you know, it's kind of breaking the ice in the middle of your class. Uh, and also reports. We can use reports in this testing stage. Uh, ways of, uh, now, these are ways of testing how much students retained, retained uh, of what the teacher uh, told them. Now, talking about the other uh, types of learners, which are adults or higher proficiency, like higher levels uh, from upper intermediate until advanced or intermediate and above, uh, we can use tapes, short stories and dialogue with short uh, exercises. We can uh, isolate and explain a grammar. Uh, we can, you know, isolate and explain the grammar using the timelines. They they really can get the timeline thing. Now, timeline can, it might be a little bit complicated when you when you're using this with younger or lower level. Uh, we can also use pair work, group work, inclusion assignment, good for practice. When it comes to the testing stage, we're just using formal testing for, for this kind of level, adults or higher level students, uh, and to perform paced assessment. Uh, now, uh, I just want to mention one thing. Um, I, will, I want to express my opinion. Now, uh, in my presentation, I have presented two approaches of teaching grammar, which is inductive and deductive approach. Uh, now, from my personal experience of teaching English, uh, I think uh, a communicative approach, it has a long lasting results or it has a long lasting effects that occurs only when the learners uh, has the opportunity uh, to hear and use the target language in, uh, um, in communication. In other words, uh, yeah, language learning, it's always successful and it's always more effective uh, when it include communicative acts. Teach uh, students, sorry, students always uh, like uh, to have uh, this communicative acts in their classroom. They, they, they actually don't prefer to have, uh, to have like uh, the deductive approach, which is considered to be a, a teacher-centered class. They, they, they really love to interact with the teacher. They really love to interact with each other they really like to, to explore the rules themselves. And uh, I mean, I, I can see them, I can see the excitement in their eyes while they're doing the job in the class. I mean, that doesn't mean the deductive approach is not successful and it's not used. Of course it could be used and it's an approach. I mean, uh, it's an approach and it has its own techniques, materials and uh, steps that we need to follow. But I, I was just talking about my, my personal experience. Now, uh, if you ask me which one do we have to use in our classroom, shall we use the deductive or inductive approach? I think uh, deciding which approach you want to use depends on your students. You need to know or, or you need to get to know your students more and you, you are the one who's going to decide which one is going to be more effective like for your students. Is it using the inductive approach or using uh, the deductive approach. So this depends on, uh, on your students themselves. And the teacher, he's the one who's going to decide which one is going to be successful for, for his students. Uh, I hope you, you enjoyed my, my presentation about uh, teaching grammar. And uh, I'm actually, I, I picked this topic because uh, my, one of my favorite skills that I, I really love to teach is grammar. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. And uh, again, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Good day.
Hello everyone, my name is Najlal Kharraz and I work as a tutor at the Faculty of Business Administration at the Libyan International Medical University. Today and in this presentation, I'll be talking about the roles and responsibilities of a tutor. So let's get started. At the beginning, I'll define briefly who a tutor is, and then I'll be talking about some of the main responsibilities that a tutor has. Tutors are generally expected to be advocates and supportive of the BPL concept. The BPL stands for problem-based learning. It's a self-directed approach of teaching and learning where students are given a problem, a trigger, and any of the subjects that we would like to teach them something about, say, for example, sales promotion, product, man, uh, product development, uh, marketing plans, or personal selling, or even HR management. So we will just, I'm sorry, give them a problem. And students have to cooperate together through a number of stages and a series of procedures of reasoning and solving the problem to achieve certain designed learning and educational object objectives at the end of the process, okay? So in such a, an operation, tutorials are seen as forums for students to integrate information, gain guidance and feedback. And tutors are simply guides or facilitators of the process. So a tutor doesn't have to be content expert. All they have to do is to ensure that all of the students are taking part in the learning process and keeping the tutorial from going way out in left field. Now, to some of the responsibilities that a tutor has. We as tutors must create a safe space where every student is heard, recognized, and accepted and where students are comfortable enough to talk openly about their difficulties, to challenge one another, and most importantly, to admit when they don't know or when they don't understand. We must be familiar with the objectives of the current unit and the objectives of the course as a whole, as a guide to progressive learning and a backdrop for evaluation. Another responsibility we have is to promote learners' critical thinking by making sure that their knowledge is challenged and propped, by asking them non-directive stimulating questions to provoke their thinking. We must ensure that objective, rigorous, but evidence-based evaluation occurs in the unit. Another thing uh, we have to do is to promote efficient to group function by helping the group to set early goals and a plan which can be modified and by serving ourselves as a role model for productive ways of giving feedback. So we must be able to give students a constructive feedback so that students observe us and learn from us how to give a constructive feedback to one another. We must provide the students you know, with, the, um, with the references and the resources needed to tackle a certain problem. And we must ensure that students are able to cite them appropriately, appropriately according to the different styles, APA, MLA, or Chicago style. Finally, because in a faculty like ours, we aim to prepare students not only to be expert in terms of the knowledge, like in, in terms of the content of what they learn, but also we would like to prepare them to be professional in their future careers, we have to promote their communicative skills such as those of giving presentations, communicating via email, communicating via memo, um, writing meeting minutes, writing resumes, and reviewing them. With the help of instructors and tutors, a profile of a PPL graduate should contain not only the knowledge, the ability to apply what they've learned, but also the skills, such as those of giving presentations, as I said, uh, teamwork, problem solving, and conducting lifelong learning and also the attitude of upholding the ethics, values, and professionalism of their professional practice. Finally, and in conclusion, I would like to say that the roles and responsibilities of a, of a, of a tutor do vary from one, from one faculty to another, from one college to another, and from one university to another. However, I've chosen to concentrate on the, on the commonalities and the resources that I've consulted. I hope that you have enjoyed my presentation. Thank you very much for watching. And yeah, these are the references. And again, thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Hello everyone, my name is Shahad Salama. Um, I graduated from Benghazi University from the Faculty of Art in 2016. Currently I'm doing my master's degree in linguistics and translation. Also I'm a certified uh, ESL and EFL, uh, English as a second language and English as a foreign language uh, teacher. And also I'm a tutor in the Libyan International University. Uh, my presentation today is going to be something a little bit different. Um, I'm supposed to be giving you a, a picture or a figure first, so you can look at it and uh, to have your guesses. Uh, this is the first picture that we're going to see. Now, I'm guessing that you are assuming this is um, art, this is a Christmas tree went wrong, uh, stuff like that. So the first thing that I'm going to be talking about, or actually my presentation today is going to be about how do we see art. Um, in order to see art, we go through some procedures or stages. Um, this is what I'm going to be tackling today. Uh, now the first, um, at the beginning, we all know that our eyes are only gate to the world around us. And um, in order to preserve a piece of an artwork, we must go through some procedures. Now, the first thing that I'm going to be tackling is looking. Now, looking may seem pretty obvious, um, but it's really important that it's worth calling a great attention. Now, looking is a physical ability, and we have the full control over the gazing and the movement and the gazing of our eyes. And as we do one of these two actions, we determine our um, observation of the world around us. Now, this stage takes us to the second stage, which is observation. Now, observation is where the closed looking comes to play. Um, it's here, um, it's a process, it's an active process actually. It's an active process that requires both time and attention, of course. It's here where the viewer starts to begin, um, starts to um, build actually a mental catalog of the visual elements of the image in front of him or in front of her. Now, which takes us, this stage takes us to the third stage, which is C. Now, as I, as I mentioned before, um, I said looking is a physical ability. On the other hand, we have seen, which is a mental ability. Now, it's a mental ability of, um, or it's a mental process of perception, you can call it as well. Um, now, seeing involves recognizing and connecting information the information that the eyes takes in um, with our previous knowledge to create meaning now once meaning is delivered we can move to the fourth stage which is describing now describing deals a lot with our thoughts now describing is the fourth stage that we go through and it helps us to um, identify and recognize our thoughts about uh, what we have seen. Now, this stage takes us to this, uh, the fifth stage, which is analyzing. Now, using the details that you've mentioned in your description, you can now apply to it some reasons to make meaning or to make a story. Now, analyzing is a opportunity to consider how figures, elements, settings um, you identified in your you identified in your description fit together with, um, with fit together to tell a story. Now uh, this takes mm -hmm. us to the final stage. Mm -hmm. This takes us to the final stage, which is Interpreting, of course. Now, interpreting is the process in which we combine our description and our analysis and our previous background or our previous knowledge with what we know about the artist or the person who made this piece of an artwork. Um, and this um, uh, this collecting of uh, ideas or of like description, the analysis and your information about the artist allows us to draw a conclusion about the story or about the final image that we have in front of us. Now, I took you through these six stages, which was look, 
look, we started with look, observe, see, describe, analyze, and interpret. Now, these are the six procedures that we go through in order to see or to look at an artwork and preserve it and get a meaning of it. Now, going back to this picture, as I told you, you went through six procedures. Now, at the, at the last procedure that um, I've mentioned is interpretation. Now, interpretation, you must have your information about the artist and so you can like draw the final conclusion. Now, this painting was painted by me. Um, I'm an artist as well. Um, this was um, a portrait of Muhammad Hassan. Uh, this is called Abstract Art. Um, it was painted by oil colors and knives. Um, here I added three hands of Muhammad Hassan's uh, uh, portrait or face, and the eye, the wrinkle uh, over here, and his mouth. So you get a glimpse of who he, who he is. Um, and now you can actually draw the final conclusion whether you see this face as Muhammad Hassan or not. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope my presentation um, would meet your expectations. Um, thank you very much. وفي الختام نتمنى أن نكون قد وفقنا في تقديم كل ما هو مفيد وحتى نلتقي في العام القادم لكم من أسرة كلية إدارة الأعمال كل المنى والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله أبركة فكنا الضياء بشمس فتية وجئنا الطبيب لدمح السقام فنحن بني الجامعة الدولية أتينك فجر نزيح الظلام فكنا الضياء